Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Nate Pritz. I am lead faculty and professor in the Academic Engagement Center, which means I teach primarily first year students here at UAGC. I'm going to be the host of this session. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion talking about co-curricular pathways to student success. And uh, I'm really excited to be joined here today by Alexa Dunn and Michelle Warren. Maybe you just caught their presentations here live at TLC 2021. If you didn't catch those presentations uh, and you're watching this recording after the fact, pause it, go watch their presentations then come back because we're going to have a really interesting conversation here today about the different intersections between student success. And I think we've got a really great perspective here because Alexa is uh, working with articulation agreements, working with transfer credits. She's seeing students literally before they walk into the classroom. And Michelle's with our doctoral program. She's seeing students sort of at the end as they're about to walk out the door. And I'm sitting there on the front lines in the first year dealing with students who are literally in their first, second, third, fourth, fifth class here at the university. So I think it's really interesting to think about this idea of co-curricular pathways. That is something that kind of spans the continuity of a student's life cycle here at UAGC. Because of course, on one level, student success can be tied to grade achievement in courses. And on an institutional level, we might think about student success in terms of retention or graduation metrics, things like that. But I think that thinking relies too heavily on primarily academic data points and doesn't consider the social or behavioral aspects of student engagement or lifelong learning. So alongside what we know is a robust curricular framework here at UAGC, students can benefit from meaningful co-curricular learning experiences that support their learning and growth, but they can also benefit from, again, that continuity that brings them from, literally brings them in the door uh, and helps make their experience a positive one, and then brings them to the end where they're becoming the mentor themselves, where they're uh, the one creating the learning opportunities for other students. I want to um, kind of ask Alexa, if you weren't in Alexa's presentation earlier, uh, you, you shared a really powerful personal story. And I think it's really important just to mention that again. I mean, there's a reason behind why we do all these different things. And you have a really uh, important, shall we say, stake in this idea of student transfer credit. Can you just kind of talk about that and, and recapture that a little bit for us? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for hosting us and for our sessions and for this panel. Um, during my undergraduate, I found out at the beginning of my second year that I had completed the advanced placement English exam with sufficient a grade to get transfer credit for an English course. And my transcript had been on file before I even started my first year. My advisors were, uh, did not advise me that I could get that credit and I ended up taking the course. And it is only one three credit course. It was not, you know, the most expensive tuition, but it was just a feeling of like being overlooked, being missed not being given the right information and almost in a way being taken advantage of. And so to know how badly I felt over something that in the grand scheme of my degree was not actually that much money really makes me come to the table for the transfer students that I work with to really make sure that we're maximizing their credits and trying to get that information out ahead of time so that they do not take a course here that they do not need. Totally. I mean, and that really speaks to this idea of needing to make progress toward the degree. I mean, we can talk a lot about goals and outcomes, and those are all super important. But for a student in the classroom, they're looking at that clock. They're looking at that calendar. And I mean, Alexa, you shared this earlier. I mean, the outcome for our students of transferring in a class means that graduation is five weeks closer for them or, or 10 weeks closer. And what does that mean? for them. I mean, that that can be uh, more than a month of full-time work that they didn't have already. It can mean that they get to go to their kids' soccer games a little bit more frequently instead of having to write papers constantly on Saturdays and Sundays. So, so those are really like human impacts to this. And I think it shows that that, that progression, that, that need for, I mean, call it happiness, call it satisfaction, I think is so important and, and is pretty easy to overlook. 
We definitely see students reach out about how they can speed up their degree. And, and this is current students already with us about what other transfer opportunities they have. Certain jobs require you to have your next degree, whatever that level is, by a certain time of the year in order to be to be considered for promotion that year. And if you miss that cutoff, you have to wait more than a year for the next round of promotions. Um, and so knowing that we can impact someone five weeks can literally be the difference between them getting a promotion and getting a better income. And then to add in those other items that you've said about having that free time, being finished earlier, being able to get those credits for students has just an astronomical like positive impact. It re-energizes them. Whenever I've spoken to a student, I had a student who had quarter credits and the way that we transfer them in, um, if they end up having three, five quarter credit courses, we transfer it as a 9.99. They literally needed 0 0.03 of a credit. And I was able to go into their transcript and find that they had nine different five quarter credit courses, which allowed me to apply that extra 0 0.01 per three courses to the, and get them graduated. These tiny little things like that can really impact them and the, the gratitude and just the impact on their life in general really makes a difference and, and helps those, those students get back into their last, you know, one or two courses and finish out strong. So. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, I feel bad when I'm doing final grades and I see a student with an 89.1 and I want to round it up for him, but I can't. And that's an, uh, an example of rounding that I think has such a huge impact on students. And so I think it's interesting to talk about this idea of progression in terms of time. But Michelle, earlier you were talking about the cognitive phases and what I'm really interested to know, you know, students are making progression from class to class. They're getting closer to their degree, closer to graduation. But talking about the cognitive apprenticeship model and those phases that you were sharing earlier, is there a way to kind of signpost those for students so that they're aware that they're making progress in terms of developing uh, their own skills, their own knowledge? Or, or is that something that kind of goes on invisibly that an instructor knows about, but a student isn't going to really connect with? Yeah, I think I, I think it's more the instructor looking at the student and going, you don't you totally don't got this, you know, and it's it's like um, you you think you do, but you really don't. And I'm going to need to really give you some additional support here in the um, modeling phase or the coaching phase, just looking over their shoulder and carefully providing deep, rich feedback. Um, and so when students come in with one of the things I was going to say to Alexa with the, we have students who come in who've gone through almost an entire other program and didn't want to finish that with that school for various reasons and um, are bringing in like a lot of curriculum that we're able to absorb, which I was surprised about and, and actually allow that student to take all that hard work and bring it into the program. And um, so to your, to your thought about what level are they coming in at, a lot of these students have that expertise already. They're at the articulation phase. They're demonstrating those skills already, ready to move on. Why make them go through the, all that again? I mean, I think that's, that's a really good point. And, it's, and it brings up something that's another really interesting intersection here between the different topics we've been talking about today. I mean, Alexa with transfer credit, whether it's experience or actual college credit, it, it's a way to honor what the student knows. It's a way to honor what they've already learned, what they actually bring to the table. Um, but Michelle, you're talking about also a way to sort of do that in the classroom as well, to make sure that students are, okay, the transcript shows it and the pocketbook shows it because they don't have to pay for the extra class, but let's celebrate that achievement in the classroom as well. Let's make sure that we honor and acknowledge that learning so that we're not... I mean, I, I get so frustrated sometimes in the classes that I teach, students come into those classes, first, second, third, fourth class, and I can see that they lack confidence. I can see that they feel like they don't know what they're doing. It's been five, 10, 15 years since they've been in school, but finding a way in the curriculum to acknowledge all the stuff they clearly know, mm -hmm. uh, a lifetime of experience and lots of skills. Mm -hmm. To find a way to acknowledge that I think can be a really powerful moment for students and get them to feel that confidence, which helps them persist, mm -hmm. helps them keep pushing through. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of that is that um, implicit knowledge that they have, that they can apply to life. And in a lot of ways they can, uh, that's where the community comes in, where they can um, take that resilience and that knowledge they have and share it with others and build up their own confidence that they're able to help other students in the learning community. So, um, you know, a lot in their, in their leadership skills that they gain and their professions in the world, bringing that into the classroom and somehow um, sh sharing that in their discussions as they think about it through the domain that they know. And then how did they, we help bring them over into the domain of the curriculum that we want them to learn. And, um, but acknowledging, like you say, all that they know and, and the, the, the things they can intuit from just being a leader or being in their professions and bringing that into the curriculum. Totally. I think that's a very important point of the, the support and the encouragement, uh, specifically our experiential essay through prior learning. They, uh, one of our prior learning specialists revamped the way we do that. And instead of having a five week timed course, it's now a self-paced course with a one-on-one -on -one sort of instructor feedback coaching them through how to write this essay, teasing out the ideas of the, they've been on a job, you've, you've worked in this position for five years, you do have, you know, you probably got some leadership skills. Have you ever thought about this? Have you thought about that? Having that within the classroom, having that within the university, um, really just celebrating and promoting that that learning is happening everywhere. It's not just in a formal learning. Uh, our UAGC student is generally the working adult. Um, many first time students don't have a previous degree necessarily. And to really sort of help them along and understand that they're not alone, that there are other people in that situation and that learning is a daily thing. We learn from everyone and everything around us if we're open to it and really acknowledging and celebrating, supporting and promoting and teaching them to do the same, then they can become peer mentors, join our champs program, like all of those certain things. I think that it's really phenomenal to really look at learning as that entire picture versus we're an institution and we do semester credits, right? Like we do a class, we do this. I think that the, the conversation today has really expanded to me how important it is that it's not just the transfer credits, it is now being able to translate that within their classroom that they might not have in transfer, but being able to then pick up the subject because they can relate it to something they do know about. Alexa, what is that class you're talking about that's uh, instructor led, but it's at their own pace? That sounds bad. It is the experiential essay for prior learning uh, it used to be EXP 200, we would offer it, and it is essentially teaching students through the modules of the essay and taking the learning outcomes of the course they think they know. Um, and I, I fully admit I am not the expert on the course itself, having moved to PLA more recently, but having dug into PLA very in depth over the past two months to try and get up to speed and learning more about it, the, the guidance has had a phenomenal impact on the success rate and not just of finishing that course for want of a better word, but also having that finished essay product to submit and to a faculty evaluator to actually get the credits awarded. And our goal is to expand that and make sure more students are aware of it, more faculty are, are aware of it. Um, if you notice someone who obviously has a team and they lead it, they might be able to test out of a leadership course or essay out of it, I should say, not test. Um, I, I think I'm blown away by the statistics and I think our PLA specialists have done a phenomenal job with it. So credit to them, really. That was going to be like the next question I wanted to ask. You, you kind of just touched on this. I mean, again, I'm a faculty member. I teach first year classes. Um, I asked you earlier, like, what can I do? What can I be on the lookout for? But I kind of want to, I'm also wondering, like, how aware are students of these opportunities? Do they come to you and say, hey, I think I can test out of this? Or is it the advisor? Is it the classroom faculty? Like, who's really 
helping to make that call, advocating for the student? It is a little bit of all of the above. Uh, so our uh, PLA department was larger in previous years, as with most of the university, we have tightened up around the edges a little bit. And the goal right now is to really get back in front of the faculty, get back in front of the advisors. Uh, a few years ago, I know that's Cert different members of the team would go when we had the four colleges, one would go to the College of Gen Ed quarterly, one would go to, you know, the College of Ed, Forbes School, and start interacting with the faculty and talking about it and just keeping it on their mind and do the same thing with our advising groups as well. And just reminding them once a quarter did help get that knowledge into their, you know, on the tip of their brain when a student says, well, I've done this job. Uh, we have several ways. We have it linked out in the Student Success Center, I believe it's, it is, on the portal. Uh, we have it on our website. Our advisors do have little sort of cheat sheets of, you know, what to do and who, where to send it. And then we also try and capture it on their application. If they have any type of professional certification, we automatically send them the information on how to sign up for the, the prior learning uh, initial review. The initial review is yes, you have something to pursue, you know, and then you go and you sign up. And, and the, the, the official prior learning process is much cheaper than a three credit course here. So doing that initial review takes out the students who definitely don't have the experience and then really helps promote the students who do to get through and to, just, to choose the correct option because there are two, two options. I don't want to monopolize all the conversation here. So please, those of you in the room, feel free to unmute or type into the chat if you have questions that you want to ask or ways you want to steer our conversation as we talk about different co-curricular pathways, things beyond um, the normal progression of classes that can help student success. But Alexa, what you were just mentioning makes me want to ask Michelle something. You know, I was you were talking earlier about how your PhD students are really creating this knowledge base of different things they've learned that, um, whether it's gonna be a video, different things that they've um, uncovered during the course of their studies. And I was looking at that, you were talking with the one student earlier who was talking about his research methods. And I was like, man, I'd love to have my English 122 students who are doing research. I'd love to have them watch the video, but I'd love to have them meet this guy. Are there conversations with your PhD students about maybe coming back and, and kind of guesting in a class at different stages to kind of share some of this knowledge and create that motivation for being having an end to the journey. What a, what a great idea. I mean, I think the that TLC video of the students talking about their own journey, um, even that would be really neat to share in the classroom as kind of guesting. Um, it would also be fun to have students come in in specifically difficult classes or to talk about the specifically difficult skills and have them guest in those during certain weeks where there's a project or you know a, a big case study that they're supposed to write at the very end and then how did that student get through it or approach it that would be a great idea i love it i uh you, you were talking before about how a student's voice sometimes carries a lot more weight than an instructor yeah. voice in the classroom i've done quite a few facebook live events for primarily for English students, English 121 and English 122. And I'm always shocked uh, when, you know, literally dozens of students show up and it's clear that they are talking about the class, the assignments, their professors outside of my purview. I can't see it. I don't hear it. I'm not part of those conversations. It's clear they've got a lot to say and they listen to each other. Sometimes I wish they wouldn't, but yeah. sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's just that little bit of motivation. Uh, like you're saying, Michelle, it's just, you know, hey, I actually did this. I'm a real person. It, yeah. Okay, I can tell them that they're going to get through this. You got this, right? I can say that in an announcement and I can post a funny video and I can post a cat meme and I can give them all the motivation I can think of. But an actual student with an actual name and face and voice saying, oh yeah, that assignment, I did it. I got yeah. through it. That means so much. Well, and not only that, think about the turn the table a little bit and look at the student who's doing the presenting and think about how much confidence they have now saying, oh yeah, I know something. I do know something. I got through that and I can actually teach others that. 
um, I think that's really powerful too, to be able to be on that side of the tutor, tutoring side. And um, that, I love that as well. I mean, that's where you learn is when you teach to or, or are able to articulate to others. I think that's where you really, you build that confidence. And I think, you know, again, with, with, with our student population, with any student population, what you're trying to overcome is that initial hesitancy, that initial sort of intimidation about the process and, and finding ways to acknowledge the learning, which is kind of what we've been talking about all along here, I think is, is one of those kind of like final building blocks. It's, it's what you were talking about earlier, Michelle, the exploration stage where students are actually creating and developing something and not just checking off boxes and not just running through the hoops. Right. That we yeah, authentic learning is definitely the real world and applying it in the real world is key also. I'm, I'm a big proponent of that as well, for sure. Yeah, we only have five weeks though. It's so tough. I mean, no. I'd, I'd love, to, love to make all my students uh, go back to my next section of the class and teach it for me or something. So, I mean, it's, I mean, how do you do that? It, but, but Alexa, you're talking about the same idea of acknowledging this experience. So, so a student has done something in the workforce for 10, 15 years, they've got professional certifications and they still might be intimidated by the online classroom, by going back to school, by looking around and thinking that everyone else knows it and they don't. So when you give them that credit, when you say to them, hey, that actually counts, I feel like that's got to be such a huge motion, moment. I think there's definitely that credit piece for them. And, I, and I've definitely had students, just the stories. It's similar to working at graduation. You know, you didn't, I didn't think I could do it. I'm a really big proponent of the, if you see it, you can be it concept. And, and that's very similar to what you've been talking about. With our partnerships, the students, the student populations are very distinct to each partner college, similar to our college having our own distinct population. And we're looking to, uh, this I did not talk about in the, in the, my own presentation, but we are looking to explore ways to leverage things like CHAMPS and our Connect alumni groups and really leverage those with the partnership students who are coming in and sort of automatically put them into a group where they can see another, you know, lady who has three kids doing this, or they can see a guy who has, it's his first time, he's the only one in college in his family, you know, never been online and really connect on whatever those individual differentiators are as people. And you can tell people from a position like a, like a faculty member or like myself uh, doing the transfer credits that, no, you do know this, you can do it, you, you can do it. But once they hear someone just like them who can do it, uh, I think that that really gives them a boost. In my own MBA studies, I very much focused on female leaders. And as a child, I didn't have that leadership in front of me, viewing them, seeing them, the only uh, person I can think of was Margaret Thatcher as I grew up in England. And I wasn't quite sure that my personality was similar to hers, which meant that I wasn't like her and couldn't do it, you know? And so really exploring that through my MBA studies, really exploring some of the, the driving factors between that. And then since then talking more about diversity, equity and inclusion and realizing that as much as I didn't see, others are seeing even less and trying to find that way of having people connect on that human level peer to peer. I think that that's so important regardless of whether it's transfer credit, work experience in the classroom itself. And I think that it does give people that boost to know I'm not alone, it has been done, I'm on the right track. And I know my own personal experience having that moment of, oh, I can. Um, I hope that we are able to give that to our students in all of these factors, in all these ways and more. I feel like that's such a, a powerful thing. And it's, and it's one thing, a lot of us went through Dr. Donna Beagle's training over the last couple of weeks. And one of the things she talks about is, is really telling those stories, making students realize that we're kind of all in it together, that we all have this story that we can tell. And it, and it goes back to this idea, Alexa, that you were saying, if, if I can see it, I can be it, um, letting, letting people know that this, there are steps on the ladder and we could take them together 
and, and it's right there. Like, let's look at those steps together. Let's figure this out. Um, I think that's, that can be really helpful. And, and transfer credit is part of how you begin that journey, take those steps. Um, but, you know, kind of along the same lines, Michelle, like you're teaching in the, in the doctoral program, you've got a PhD. I mean, is there a, are there moments where you talk with those students and you're like, Hey, I pulled my hair out too. Hey, I never knew I could get a hundred pages done on my dissertation. Like that kind of reverse mentoring in a way seems like it's gotta be pretty powerful. Yeah, they, they do appreciate our own war stories. Uh, stories like, you know, me getting up at four in the morning in order to work on my dissertation or two in the morning to work on it and then go back to bed for a couple hours. And uh, just realizing it kind of helps set in to them the, the work and the effort, extra effort and sacrifice that it takes to do this journey, to get this doctorate. And, um, and, but also more importantly, I think the war stories like in, the, in residencies, the whole day is live. We have two full live days and that is so powerful and so rich. And there they're talking about their own experiences and how they're kind of getting through this and they're learning from each other so beautifully, like how, you know, what, what are those? And we even have an exercise where they come in the second day, it's a life journey. And how did your life journey get to you to this, this doctorate right now? And realizing that the resilience and the incredible um, in skills and powers that they already have, that they are bringing with them to this journey and, um, and see, seeing, learning about each other's journeys and also seeing those skills within themselves. I think one of the biggest things that our students experience is the imposter syndrome, feeling like I'm an imposter. I don't know this. I can't do this. I'm not like all those other students there. They, they're not imposters. I am. And so getting them connected in, in, the, in the student club and also in the in residencies and also in the classrooms to see that, you know, everybody's feeling that way. I even feel like an imposter a lot of times. And it, it you know, that, that is part of what we've got to get through and acknowledge that everybody else is going through the same thing you are, right? I mean, and I think what's really um, kind of touching me through some of the different things we're talking about is that so much of what we're dealing with with students, some of these things are not, I mean, they're not curricular. There isn't an outcome in the class or in the program that's tied to that. There could be, but but for the yeah. for the most part, there isn't. So I could I could pull up my English 121 classroom and I could show you those course learning outcomes, and they're awesome. But they don't touch on some of these other things, Alexa, that you're dealing with on the front end, Michelle, that, that you're talking about as well. And so I'm just really interested in in ways that we can try to have those conversations. Michelle, you're talking about the, the live day, the residential day. Uh -huh. um, and you mentioned student clubs earlier. That's a great way for mm -hmm. students to connect sort of outside the confines of the classroom. But I just wonder, you know, what are, what are some other things that, that people are doing, Alexa, you, Michelle, or, or any, anyone else in the room even, just different things that you're, different ways you're conducting um, interactions with students to, to really create that you know, I want to call it a community sense. I want to call it a, a campus sense. You know, you know, Nate, I'm going to turn that around to you because I am dying to hear more about <laughs> your Facebook, your live Facebook uh, journey. How's, how, what is that like? Well, that was those. So that was actually partly because English 121, I'll give you a little background here. English 121 is one of those classes that students hate uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons they didn't like it was because it was actually super hard. Um, there were some problems with the design of the class. And I got, I, I was told from, so we have this robust social media division here at UAGC and they were constantly in contact with me. I asked them to be, and I was just like, what's the chatter? What, what are students, what don't they like? Uh -huh. And when, when I redeveloped the class, I talked to the social media people and I was like, look, I want to get in front of students. I want to start telling students about this. So I met with advisors. I met with the CEDL. I met with everybody to talk about this class and social media was like, let's get you in front of students. Let's do a Facebook wow. live event. And uh, it was it was pretty cool just to have, I mean, I don't even have a Facebook account myself. So social media um, hooked that whole thing up for me. And I just sat here and, you know, students came wow. in and it was it was a cool moment. I mean, I, I meet live with my classes optionally uh, every week. So I get a chance to talk to my students and to other students in the course that I'm teaching. Uh -huh. So anyone uh -huh. taking 121, anyone taking 225. Um, 
But this was outside the classroom entirely. These students were talking about things that they probably wouldn't talk about to their classroom teacher because they don't want them to know Mm -hmm. what they're dealing with behind the scenes. They don't want it to um, influence the grade, influence where the the teacher might see them. So it was it was it was a cool thing. Um, And and it just got me thinking, like, there's got to be other ways to do this where, you know, you sort of take the Ph.D., take the doctor off the front of my name that you can see in my window there. Take that off for a second. Um, let's get outside the classroom and, and have this conversation. No, I love that. That's powerful. Yeah. And I think the student clubs has a live opportunity as well. I need to check with Ben on that, but that's cool. Super cool. Love I'd love to have you. I may be coming to you for some advice. Yeah. With partnerships. <laughs> it is getting it in front of people. We're an online institution. Right. There is a lot of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with the pandemic, we've all learned a lot more about Zoom and the, the functionalities. And we have wanted to do Facebook Lives, not just on our page, but also in conjunction on our partner pages. And I think that that is a very, very powerful tool of getting it out there. Um, getting that in-person connection and not just for the students, but for faculty and staff to remember that this is a person behind the screen. They have things going on, like you said, that they don't want to share for whatever the reason is. Um, I was reading, uh, someone was, it's not our student, but a student was talking about how they missed four days of a course and they were supposed to miss three and the faculty put it down to 50% instead of their grade they, because of their alleged policies, you know, and they had had flu and had a sick note for the four days, right? So getting people to remember that it's a person and that people have lives and that there's busy stuff going on behind the scenes that we don't know about and really just having that empathetic ear to, to where our students are and what they're doing. Um, I am open to any and all suggestions on how I can get this in front of faculty, staff, people at our partner colleges. We just, uh, super exciting, we hired a coordinator in uh, for our Dallas area and for the Maricopa, Arizona area. And they will be on campus with our prospective students talking to the people at Maricopa and even trying to help them get through the Maricopa associate's degree first, you know, and saying, what else do you have left? And did you know you only have two courses that that's, you know, nothing. And then, Hey, maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't pass this course now. What's, what's three more months, right? Like three more months doesn't make you a failure. It just means that you got there a little bit after you thought you would. And really making sure that that, that human connection and that support is there. Um, definitely open to any and all ideas. And we'll probably be emailing you uh, afterwards for some tips on Facebook Lives. It was, it was nerve wracking, I'll tell you. Because <laughs> you never know what people are going to ask. When, you know, it's, it's literally live. And it's also mm-hmm. because it's outside the classroom because we don't have that sort of barrier of the outcomes, the activities, students are going to throw things at me that I'm, I don't know even know if I want to talk about, you know what I mean? Like, I hate to say it like that, but I'm not a guidance counselor and I'm not qualified to talk about certain things. I can talk, I can help you diagnose your sentence problems. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to help with a lot of other issues. So, so it is kind of a really raw vulnerable moment. And I, I feel like Students are doing that every day in the classroom. We can do that too in our roles, um, but it's it's difficult to really kind of figure out how to organize that. But yeah, Alexa, you you have a, a very uh, valued uh, colleague, Dr. Amy Rogers, a good friend of mine. I've told her that I'll do anything to help any aspect of this because I, I miss, you know, at, at a previous role, at a previous institution, I would go into high schools, you know, once a month, I would draw the short straw and I'd have to go sit in the guidance counselor's office on, on a Friday and meet with students who wanted to come in. And, you know, at that kind of in-person connection, you know, and Michelle's replicating that with the live residencies. But I know we've got people in the room, Matt Phillips in Career Services, Jennifer Dunn's from the Writing Center, like at other institutions, those are places where you can go into, you can talk to the person. So I think we're all really invested in trying to figure out how to make our spaces an actual space. How can we get the students to, to come there, to interact, to be open? And uh, 
you know, to, to allow their vulnerabilities and, and their strengths to really come to the forefront um, in a place they feel is safe, but also separate from a place where they're being graded, let's say. Uh, how many students yeah. come, come to your, um, your weekly uh, live, live sessions and how long do you hold those? Are they a half hour or how, how do you do it? So it's pretty variable. Um, and I did a presentation on this a couple of years ago. Uh, I could I could share, um, it was a TLC presentation, a big plug for TLC. What a great conference, what a great time to come together and share ideas. Uh, I, we, in the Academic Engagement Center, there are actually several classes now that do this. Um, we all do it a little bit differently. My live sessions, I invite every student who's currently enrolled in a particular course. So let's say English 225, that might be 500 students every week I invite. I will get somewhere between six and 15 students showing up um, for a variety of reasons. I just, I pick a time, maybe students can't make it, whatever. Uh, and I, I typically say that I'm gonna hold these sessions for an hour. Uh, sometimes they don't go the full hour because I just don't have people there. Um, sometimes it's, it's a little longer because people seem to be having really good conversations. Uh, I know my colleague, uh, Mark Nitka, who works with the honors programs and is in our uh, Sci 207 class, he says that a lot of times he'll kind of sit back and his students, the students will talk to each other. Uh, in mine, it tends to be more of like a Q&A sort of thing. Students will ask me about an assignment. I'll go to the classroom. I'll talk about it. Then I'll bounce to something else. I'll bounce to something else. Um, so there are a lot of different ways they work. Um, uh, but, th but they're a ton of fun and they, they give you that moment where you remind yourself why you're doing this. You know, there's a person behind the screen. Uh, in fact, sometimes there's several people because as you're talking to a student, you see two people walk behind them or a cat in the chair behind them. And you, and you understand they're also making dinner while trying to figure out how to do the week five assignment. And so there's these really great moments where as a teacher, it reminds me to give a little bit more. And to be a little bit flexible, I'm not going to rate. I'm not going to lower the rigor, right? I'm not going to lower the bar, but I am going to acknowledge that a lot of our students are here at UAGC because traditional education didn't work for them. So why would I hold them to traditional education standards if that's the case? Um, so it's so it's it's a it's a lot of fun, um, and it's yeah. it's definitely been important to my practice as a teacher to to connect and to learn more about that. Well, and you know when you connect with the students, you. It, you you're right. You're pra to your practice. You, you start to realize the the depth and uh, in the and how where these students have come from and how strong they are and how much they've accomplished in their lives. And here I am in this place of expertise, and yet I feel like the roles should be switched sometimes because they are just so skillful in managing life, their life, and the lives of their families and what they do and what they know. And and um, it's just a, a it's been really enriching for me to have those one-on-one -on -one exchanges and experiences with students and such a delight I get so much joy out of talking to them and meeting them and getting to know them and just it's such a blast I just love it I mean I think it's safe to say that none of us when we were in high school thought we were going to be online teachers or um, matriculation experts or online career service um, representatives or online writing center I mean it these weren't careers that existed uh, for us so I think it's 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 always important to have those human connections because that's probably part of why we got into this where we got into this to have those connections and finding ways to replicate that online is, is really what this idea of creating co-curricular pathways is all about. Realizing that the student is more than the class, that there's something bigger than that that we need to connect with. And it's on all of us. It's on the advisors. It's on us as faculty. It's on every different support staff and every different role throughout the entire university to really step, I don't know, not through, behind, around the computer screen, to, to realize that there's more happening than just that progression from class to class. And, and how do we interact with that? How do we become part of that? How do we honor that? Uh, I think those are all the kinds of questions that we're asking ourselves. We're not coming up with answers. We're coming up with possible solutions, things we can try. Yeah. Um, so I, I, think I, it's, I, I think it's a good conversation. You, you know, when you said that step around, I, I came up with a great little term about um, 
for an instructional strategy is breaking the breaking the fourth wall like in, in theater, you know, how you break that fourth wall and you actually talk to the audience. <laughs> that would be fun, a fun instructional strategy, breaking the fourth wall and actually talking to the student, right? Right. <laughs> we did a we did a, an icebreaker one time in, in a session I was doing live with a bunch of students and I told them ahead of time, I said, bring a ball to this. And, and so I held a ball and I said, I'm going to pass this to you. And I, you know, go like this. And then the student goes like this with their ball. And so, I mean, it's dumb. It's hokey. It's one of those things. No, it's so, it's so cheesy and silly, but everyone loved it. You know, I kind of hate, that's the part of teaching I never liked, you know, the kind of funny, jokey icebreaker stuff, but boy, did it work. And boy, did people like it because it made that connection. We broke the fourth wall or the the computer. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) I love it. That's so cool. Well, we're nearing the end of our time here. Uh, I really want to, I want to just thank you guys both, Alexa and Michelle, for your contributions earlier today at TLC. Uh, If you're watching this panel discussion after the fact, please make time to go back and watch their presentations. It gives you a lot more background on the transfer credit issue that Alexa is, is talking about and the ways that cognitive apprenticeship model can really influence not only what our PhD students are learning, but learning in general that Michelle was talking about earlier, really valuable contributors to this idea that the classroom is where we meet our students, but it's not really where they live their lives. It's not the entire story. Finding ways to understand that journey, help, and help, help, help students along on it. That's really what creating co-curricular pathways is all about. Um, so again, I wanna, I wanna thank you both for your contributions to this. I think we had a really good conversation here and I appreciate all of you coming uh, and contributing your ideas and, and listening in. I think it's, it's something that we can keep talking about. I'll look for that email, Alexa. Uh, and Michelle, I'm going to get some of your students to pop into my class in the future. I think that'll be fun. <laughs> well, you got it. You got it. I'll set that up for you for sure. <laughs> Brilliant Great. job of, uh, of moderating. Thank you, Nathan. That was awesome. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah of course. Oh, do I need to say this again? Hang on. I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. Encourage you to attend more sessions. Oh, TLC is fantastic. We love it. You love it. Go see more presentations. Still going on for a couple of days, right, Allison? Yeah. Yes, it's going on until Thursday or through awesome. Thursday. Yeah. Oh, great. boy. That's Thank great. you all so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. It was a blast. Thank you.